my friend, I want to welcome you into today's edition of a midweek meditation. And before I share God's word, I want to welcome you into a small time of worship in the presence of God. Let's sing together, praise God, and come back for a study of God's word. Savior, He can move the mountains. My 
my God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. All the of salvation. Heroes in conquer the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Let me read to you from Job chapter 1 and verse 8, where the Bible says, According to the words of the Lord unto Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil? Friend of mine, when we take a look at this particular portion of scripture, trying to glean the message that God has for us and our generation, I want to firstly give you some information about the book of which this verse is a part. Now, when we start studying scripture, my friend, we will come to understand firstly that the Holy Bible is actually a collection of 66 different books. And there are many scholars who study scripture that say Job was actually the first book to be written amongst the 66 books of the Bible. Now, the name of the book is actually given after the central character of the book named Job, often thought to be a contemporary of Father Abraham, who is more maybe famous. He lived in a land called Uz, that is again popularly known to be a place that was east of Sinai in the land of the Midianites. Meaning, this man, during his lifetime, was a man who was amongst the Gentiles, people who were ungodly, people who did not know God and his will. We find references to this particular man called Job in Ezekiel 14, verse 14 and 14, verse 20. There are references to this man again in the epistle written by James in chapter 5 and verse 11. And all of these references actually tell us that the story, this, uh, the biography of Job was actually known to people throughout history. This confirms that this is not a fable, but on the other hand, this is part of true history. And you need to understand that in Hebrew, Job actually means persecuted or tormented, a man who has suffered pain. And I need you to understand that this would maybe be the most apt title for this book. God's word introduces Job to be, number one, a blameless person. Number two, uh, the word calls him an upright man. Three, he is introduced to be God-fearing. And the Bible also says he was one who shunned evil, meaning he would not participate in evil activity. He would run away from it. This book and its content actually talks about three things, my friend. Three broad classifications to the content in this book. Number one, it talks about the troubles of this righteous man. Secondly, it talks about the reaction of Job to his troubles. And thirdly, my friend, I believe it talks about God's reward to Job for the way in which he acted in his time of trouble. Today, I want to take some time to look at Job's troubles so that we can learn a few lessons regarding how we need to act in our time of trouble. Let's turn to the word. I'm reading from Job chapter 1 and verse 6 here. The Bible says, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came amongst them. Let me try to explain this verse firstly. Here, the Bible talks about a day. What is so special about this one? I believe it is a day when all those beings called the sons of God come before God to give a report unto the Lord Almighty regarding their activities. Is this one unique day in all of time? I believe not, basically because 
There is a reference to the same kind of day in chapter 2 and verse 1 also. Meaning, this particular day of mustering, this particular day when God would hold all of his sons to account, was a regular event in the heavenlies. Now, many people get to be confused about who these sons of God really are. Well, I'll try to explain in this way. When we read through the Bible, we find three different types of children of God found there. Number one, we find a personality called the only begotten son of God. You know who that is? That personality is the son of God, our Savior, Jesus Christ, our Lord. He is called the only begotten son of God. Secondly, we find created sons of God. Who are they? They are the angelic beings that are found in many places in the Holy Scriptures. Job chapter 38 and verse 7 calls these angelic beings as the sons of God. Thirdly, we find Ephesians actually calling the New Testament believers like us adopted children of God. Now, my friend, you need to understand that the sons of God mentioned here in this particular portion of scripture are the angelic beings. But many people again get to be confused when they find Satan also in that group of angelic beings standing before God. Let me tell you why. Let me tell you why. It is basically because Satan is also a created son of God. He's one amongst the angelic beings, my friend. When you look at what happened to him, we will find that Satan wasn't initially called so. He was once a cherub, an angelic being called Lucifer. It was his rebellion unto God, the Almighty God, that brought him down into this state of being called Satan and being in enmity with the living God. Now the Bible says, all of these angelic beings, on a particular predestined day, came to present themselves before God. And we find Satan also coming there so that he might report to God. This idea is further proven by Job 1 and verse 7, where God asks him, from where do you come? This is a question God poses not to the angelic beings in general, but unto Satan himself. Now, my friend, seeing the way he carries himself, we might actually end up thinking that Satan is the omnipotent one above whom there is none in authority. But, number one, the fact that he presents himself before God on Master Day. Number two, the fact that God asks him questions and holds him accountable. Number three, the fact that he answers God's questions and doesn't refuse to report unto God. These facts actually prove to us that our God is the omnipotent one. He is the one in charge above whom there is no other. And because our God is greater with more power and authority than the devil, because the devil is just a created being who depends on the creator for his very existence, we need to overcome our fear of the devil by understanding that we are on the side of the greater one, our God. Now, my friend, we find in scripture here, Satan actually being peeved with God, questioning him in front of the rest of the angels. So you know what he does? He answers God with a little bit of insolence. Job 1 and verse 7 echoes him speaking this way. From going to and fro on the earth and from walking back and forth on it. You know what the implication of this answer was? He is actually telling God, God, in heaven you are all in all. You rule here. But on the earth, you are not ruler there. I rule out there. Wherever I want to go, I just simply go. Nobody hinders me. Whatever I want to do there, I just simply do. There is none who can stop me. But when God finds Satan answering him back with insolence, you know what God does? God is quick to put him in his place. Job 1 and 8 where God says, Have you considered my servant Job? Is actually the answer God gives unto Satan. You know what the implication of this statement is? For you, devil, to gain entry into a person's life, 
into a person's you know uh, home for you to gain entry into some place to have free reign there there needs to be at least three different things number one there needs to be fear number two there needs to be doubt out there doubt in god doubt in god's word and number three there surely has to be sin but god says look at my servant job consider him he is upright he is blameless he is god fearing he shuns evil meaning in short god is telling the devil you got no business there you cannot enter there that is not a place that is not a life in which you have free reign it is not a place into which you know you can go freely at will no you will be obstructed there because he lives a sinless life the devil realized that he had been pulled down he also realizes that he's lost the battle with god now so he retaliates by saying job 1 verse 9 to 11 he says does job fear god for nothing have you not made a hedge around him around his household and around all that he has on every side you have blessed the work of his hands and his and his possessions have increased in the land but now stretch out your hand and touch all that he has and he will surely curse you to your face my friend when satan retaliates this way when we read through scripture we find god accepts satan's challenge he allows the devil to wage a war against job and satan after he just you know runs a muck in job's life the experience job has in the situation is actually penned down in almost 41 chapters of the bible as a time of trouble that he had to endure it is a story of great persecution of great trial that came into the life of job and my friend today when we also are in a time of trial and tribulation when there is a lot of uncertainty here in the situation that we face in the circumstances that are all around us i want to really look into this particular portion of scripture so that we might learn a few things that will help us come through as victors in this battle that we are facing right now here are a few things number 1 There are many different reasons as to why people end up in distress and difficulty. What are they? Many people ask me. Let me tell you. Number one would be sinful lifestyles that people live. When you live in sinfulness, you can be sure of one thing: this sin is going to lead you into the pit of trouble, into trials. That is a surety. Again, wrong decisions that we take. You need to understand decisions are choices we make and choices have consequences. So in every time of choice that you take the wrong choice the wrong decision you can be sure you will have you know trouble coming your way. Many people entertain faulty friendships in their life. And you need to understand these faulty friends you have people who are maybe quarrelsome people who are ungodly people who are sinful all of these people have the potential to drag you down the pathway of trouble there are many such reasons my friend that contribute to bringing us into an hour of trial but we need to understand sometimes people who live like job a bright blameless god fearing you know lives that shun evil even they end up facing trouble First Corinthians 10 verse 13 actually tells us no temptation has overtaken you except such as is common unto man. What is the message here? The Bible is actually teaching us your issue, our issue is not unique. It is not unique. Jesus himself while on planet earth he told us talk to us saying this way in this world you will have tribulation meaning If we end up opening our lives in the land of the living on one morning it is a surety that we will face trouble it is a surety 
So what do we need to do? What is the first lesson that we need to imbibe from these scriptures? We need to understand that we have to learn to deal with trouble and not deny it. It's a surety that we cannot deny. So we need to learn to deal with trouble. The second lesson, Job's biography would actually teach us that whatever be the reason for the trouble that we face, whatever be the reason, the Bible teaches us that one, God knows about it, and two, that God has allowed it. We need to understand these principles, my friend. Let me take you to James chapter 1 and verse 13. The Bible says here, let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. What is the Bible talking about here? It is saying, God did not bring temptation into your life. He's not the source of your temptation. But on the other hand, we need to understand, he knows about it and he has allowed this to happen. Third lesson, whatever God does, Whatever God does, He does with a purpose, my friend. He does it with a purpose. So that we can understand the magnitude of this lesson, my friend, we need to firstly look at two particular words in this regard that are recorded in Scripture. James chapter 1 and verse 13, the verse I was talking about right now, it talks to us and tells us that God does not T-E-M-P-T, tempt, right? It talks about tempt, that's one word. But when we look at Genesis chapter 22 and verse 1, it is written there that now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham. This is another word in this regard that we need to properly understand. Test, T-E-S-T. -E Why do we look at these two words? Because whether it is a temptation or whether it is a test. Both of these manifest in the form of trials in our life. Both of these manifest as trials in our life. But we need to understand the, these two words are radically different, my friend. They are radically different. They are not just different in spellings, but number one, they are different from the source itself. Temptation, it comes not from God, but it comes from the devil. It comes from the devil. But testing, the source is not the devil, it is God. It is God who tests his people. Secondly, we need to understand, it is not just the source that is different, it is different in the purpose for which it is brought forth. Temptation that the devil brings into a person's life, it is done with the purpose of making this person fail and fall away from God and His grace. That is the purpose of temptation. But testing times that are allowed by God, these are not designed to make you fail and fall away. No, God has a different purpose. And the purpose of God behind giving you a test is that He wants to promote you and reward you when you pass this test. Here are three things about God allowed tests that you need to know. First one. First one. Let me tell you this way, my friend. Once when I was in kindergarten, I had a teacher who was a foreigner by name Madam Laura. You know how she would teach? She would ask us all to sit on the floor where mats were laid and she would hold a red apple in her hand and tell us, this is an apple and it is spelt as A-P-P-L-E. At the end of the year, if we could bring ourselves to stand before the whole class unashamedly, stand before, you know, Madam Laura and tell her that an apple was spelt A-P-P-L-E, we would pass from kindergarten to upper kindergarten. It was all right then, it was fun then. But when we graduated from upper kindergarten to primary school, and then into upper primary school, education on the whole took a different turn, you know. Things started getting bad for us. I'll tell you why also. 
little simple English that became paper one, paper two, and it was filled with grammar, literature, annotations, and poetry that we had to learn by heart. Mathematics became paper one and paper two. Social studies became history, civics, and geography. Science became physics, chemistry, and math. And what we had to learn was so vast that we really had trouble. Imagine me going to the principal and saying this way, Madam or sir, see, this syllabus is so vast that I cannot bring myself to study this. Let me tell you, I'll come stand before you and spell out what apple is like. A-P-P-L-E. Give me promotion. What would be the principal's reaction? I believe the principal would look at me, maybe smile, or maybe even laugh in scorn and tell me, see, son, if you are looking for a small promotion, all you need to do is to take a small test. But if you are looking for something bigger, greater promotion, greater reward, the test you have to pass will be greater. So what is it that we need to understand here about tests? We need to understand that small tests bring small promotions. Large tests, great tests, big time tests, these are what bring big promotion into our life. And regarding the tests that God allows into our lives, we need to understand, my friend, the size of the test is an indicator of how great your calling is. The size of the test is an indicator of how great the reward and promotion God has prepared for us is. So when you end your great trials, just pat yourself on the back. Encourage yourself by saying that the promotion that comes after this, the reward that is waiting for us, is greater. Encourage yourself with this. Number two, regarding tests. The second principle regarding tests that you need to understand is, tests actually tell you how well you studied, prepared, how ready you are to face the next thing. It is the testing time that reveals all of this, my friend. And many a time, when things are going smoothly, when there are no trials, no tribulations, we think we are people of the faith. We know scripture, we know God, we will stand strong and all that. It is a trial. It is a trial. It is the tribulation. It is the testing time that God allows into our life that actually proves how good a believer we really are. You know, my friend, there are a million things about us that God knows and we don't. Did you catch that? Did you catch that? There are a million things about us that God knows and we don't. But some of these things, you know, can actually block the blessing that God wants us to really receive. So God has no option but to reveal unto us what we need to deal with. He has to reveal unto us what those obstacles to the blessing are so that we will really weed it out. Take it out of our life. How does he do this? He puts testing times into our life. These tests reveal who we are and what we really do. Can I tell you one more thing about God allowed tests in our life? In our younger days, we had to face an examination called the SSLC in our 10th standard, secondary school leaving certificate. Then there was pre-degree, then comes the degree and all that. These are secular tests, examinations we take, right? You know what the good part about such tests are? If you feel you cannot cope with it, you can simply quit. You can simply quit. But with God's tests, I want, to, I want to just share this with you. With the tests that God brings into our life, if you don't pass, 
God will make you retake it. God will make you retake it. There is no quitting, you know. There is no quitting and running away. You don't pass one test, you have to do it again. So I want to give you this advice, my friend. The best thing that can happen to you is for you to pass the test the first time itself. You need to pass the test the first time itself. What is the fourth lesson that we can find in the book of Job? Let me give you a few verses, my friend. Hebrews 13 and verse 5. It says, according to the words of God, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Psalm 23 and verse 4 is a testimony of David who actually enjoyed what this promise meant. According his experience of God's presence in his time of trouble, he says this way, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I do not fear any kind of evil. Why? Because you are with me. Because you are with me. You know, my friend, this is a revelation you need to absolutely have. A revelation that God is with you. Not just in your hour of happiness. Not just in those moments when you are at peace. Not just in those moments when you enjoy prosperity. But you need to remember, God is with you even in those moments of adversity that you face. God is with you. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. Job, while he was going through the trial, he might not have really understood this. But when it all came to an end, when he found God dealing with every moment of anguish, every moment of distress that he had ever faced in his life, when he was rewarded and recompensed for what he had to go through, Job understood. There was not one moment when God was far away from me. And I want to tell you one more truth, my friend. In a time of distress, when we go through trials, when we face disappointment, when we are in difficulty, those are moments in which we just simply need to know and we just keep asking, where is God? Psalm 46 and verse 1 answers this question deep down inside of our hearts by saying this way, God is a refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. So when you need Him, whether you're going into a labor room where your husband cannot follow you, whether you are going into a courtroom where none else can actually help you. Whether you are in a time of trouble where you have nowhere and no person to whom you can look for help. God says, I am there with you. I am a very present help in your time of trouble. Remember this, my friend. Remember this. And here is the fifth lesson I want to share with you. Fifth lesson. Psalm 103 and verse 14. Psalm 103 and verse 14. The Bible says, For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. Let me just share with you some verses here. 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 13. The Bible says, No temptation has overtaken you except as such is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able but with the temptation will also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Before I try to explain these verses, let me give you one more scripture portion. James chapter 1 verses 2, 3 and 4. The Bible says that, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Now, when we look at these three scripture portions, understand these things, my friend. Understand these things. Number one, God does not mind you being happy. God does not mind you being happy. In fact, I believe He likes it, He loves it when you're happy. 
But I need you to understand, his focus is not your happiness, it is your development. It is your development. Your development into you know, perfection. Your development into a situation of being complete, lacking nothing. As regards your faith, your spirituality, your character and so on. God's focus is your development. When you understand this, imagine going to a gymnasium. You're going there with the objective of developing your body. You want to develop your muscles and so on. How do they do this? They tell you to exercise, take weights and so on, right? Meaning they put a burden on you and ask you to lift the burden. How does it all start? You don't have the ability to lift weights. They'll give you a 5 kilo dumbbell. Ask you to lift it this way. Exercise with it. How long will they let you use the 5 kilo dumbbell until these 5 kilo dumbbells are very easy to lift? What does it ease signify unto you? It says, now your muscles have developed beyond the 5 kilo ability. So what do the gymnasium owners, the trainers, they do? They ask you to put down the 5 kilos and take up a 10 kilo dumbbell. You have difficulty lifting it. Your muscles are stressed and in pain. But they do not let you go back to the 5 kilo one. You, you are asked to lift the 10 kilo one. Maybe 10 days down the line. There will be no more stress for your muscles. It will get easier. And at that moment, the trainer will intervene again and give you a 15 kilo dumbbell or a weight in the place of the 10 kilo one. But I want to assure you, when this gets to be easy, when you put maybe two 20 kilo plates on each side of the bar and start lifting weights, the trainer will by no means come to you and ask you to lift maybe 350 kilos. Why? Because the trainer knows you don't have the capacity for that right now. It's going to break your bones, break your back, maybe even kill you. And this is the same way in which you need to interpret 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13 where it says that God will never give you a test that is beyond your ability. The 350 kilo burden, it will not be placed on your back. But you can be sure of something. As the days go on, He will grow you in the faith. Grow you in your trust in Him. How will this development be done? He will ask you to go through bigger, greater trials as the day, days go on. This is a surety. But you can be sure of this also, my friend. He is not going to leave you. He is not going to forsake you. He will be with you and see you through all of what you need to get through. He will help you develop. He will help you develop. He will help you develop. While you're going through this developmental phase, my friend, which we oftentimes call trials, there is a sixth lesson in Job that we need to learn. In chapter 1 and verse 12, God says unto the devil, don't lay your hands on his person. And we find the devil not doing that. The devil did away with Job's wealth, his children, his family, but did not lay his hand on Job's person. Chapter 2 and verse 6, God says, you can touch his body, but don't take his life. And the devil actually oppressed his health. Job's body was covered with boils from the soles of his feet to the top of his head. The devil actually attacked him that way. But he did not take his life. The devil did not take Job's life. What does this teach us? It teaches us, number one, that the extent of the test is not decided by the devil, it is not decided by other people, it is decided by God. Again, when we read through the book of Job, 
we find that the length of time for which we have to endure the trial is not decided by the devil, it is decided by God. And thirdly, we need to understand, we can see this in the book of Job, that the moment of deliverance, when we should have a miracle, when we should be delivered, when our test should become a testimony, that is again not decided by the devil or by other people, it is decided by our God. Now this should bring great solace unto you. You know why? Because God for us is not just a powerful being somewhere up there in the heavens. On the other hand, he is our heavenly father. A father for whom we are precious children for. And because our relationship is like that, a son and a father, a daughter and a father, we can be sure of one thing. He will see us through what we need to get through. And even though he might not show up when we want him to, he'll never be late. He will come through at the right time to give us our breakthrough. We can be sure of this. If the devil had his way, he would not stop until we are destroyed. But be sure of this, my friend, the devil will not have his way. God is the one who is deciding. And here is the final thing that I want to share with you, the seventh lesson. When Paul the apostle was actually being barraged by an angel of the devil that he calls a thorn in my flesh, he went to God and started praying, God, take this thorn away from me. He prayed once, twice. He says he prayed for three times. But you know what, what God's answer was? He said this way, my grace is sufficient for you. My grace is sufficient for you. God was saying, see Paul, I'm not going to deliver you from this trial. I'm going to let it be there in your life. You know why? Because I have granted you so much of revelation that these revelations can lift you up with pride and later on this pride can become your source of disaster. This pride can actually kill you, end you up in eternal hell. But because I want you in heaven, not hell, I'm going to let this be, whereby you understand you are human, a frail human being, you're not God. Even with all of this revelation, even with all the power of God, the anointing that is flowing through your life, you still keep yourself humble before me. You depend on me. You go according to my will. You align your life with my word. I'm going to keep this thorn there. But I want to assure you, while you're enduring the trial, my grace will be with you and I'm sure, I want to assure you, God says, I want to assure you, Paul, my grace will be sufficient for you, meaning it will help you endure. It will see you through every moment of tears. It will see you through every moment of trouble and torment. And this is going to be our situation also. While we go through trials, God will fill our life with His grace, whereby his grace will empower us to endure. Do you feel right now that grace is running out? I want to assure you, I want to assure you, the very reason as to why you could hold on for so long in this kind of a trying time is because the all-sufficient grace of God was being abundantly poured out into your life. But now, now, do you feel that grace is running out? I prophesy unto you in the name of the Lord. You feel that way basically because deliverance is near. Deliverance is near. And this day I want to assure you my friend. Until deliverance comes, grace will be there in your life. When you find grace has run out, be sure you will be delivered. A miracle will be in your hands. Can I just pray with you? Would you close your eyes, open your heart, and be with me in this moment of prayer? Father divine, I just commit this brother, the sister, into your mighty hands, O God. In this time, O God, when the world is being threatened by a pandemic, 
When there is an economic meltdown in almost every place, every country that is known unto man. When many people, oh God, are facing job losses and salary cuts, when they do not really know how to make both ends meet and go forward. I just pray, O oh God, that this brother, this sister would be granted a revelation that even in this moment of trouble, you are with them. Also, Lord, I pray that you grant them an assurance that you're going to see them through this phase of their life and get them their breakthrough that they so badly want, to oh God. I just pray that what you did for Job, in those times you will do again in this person's life right now. Grant them the blessing, O oh God, of getting everything back that they once lost. Uh, grant them the blessing, O oh God, of you know, long life, of fruitfulness, of abundance. That is my prayer for them. Work a miracle, Master. We are not asking you for things that are possible to get done by power or by might, O oh God. We ask you for things that only you can do to manifest in our life. Do for us what only you can. In Jesus' name I pray. And the saint said, Amen and Amen. Thank you for giving me an opportunity to be part of your spiritual life. This day, I've got a small free gift for you. It's in the form of a book, The Pursuit of Extraordinary. If you'd like to receive it from us, do WhatsApp 80861-80863 with your name and address. And we'll send it to you for free. May God bless you and use the book to be a blessing in your life.